welcome to Cornell Alliance for Science Live. And this is the first in a series of webinars where we'll be talking about um, GMO first. So our topic today is BT brinjal. It's the first genetically modified food crop approved in South Asia, and it's currently being grown in Bangladesh. In subsequent weeks, we'll be discussing the GMO papaya, the GM salmon, and the GM cowpea. All of them are first in their own way. So our guest today is um, Dr. Tony Shelton. He's an applied insect ecologist at Cornell University who works on developing knowledge that can be used for insect pest management programs, both domestically and internationally. He is focused on developing more efficient and safer insect management practices, and he works with growers and extension educators to help them implement these systems. Starting in 2015, Tony was director of a USAID funded project for insect resistant eggplant in Bangladesh and the Philippines, which is what we'll be talking about today. So um, let me say welcome, Tony, and thank you for making time to be with us today. Good to see you, Joan. Good to see you too. Even at a distance. Yes, it is. I think that's how most of us are seeing each other these days. Um, so before we actually, I know you have a PowerPoint to share with us that'll give us more details about this, but before we jump into that, I just wanted to have you tell us a little bit about why you're interested in taking an approach to controlling in, you know, crop pests, insect pests, that doesn't involve application of pesticides. So, so what interested you about this particular project? Oh, a number of things interested me about it. Um, one is uh, basically I try and develop management programs that are uh, more sustainable, uh, better return for the grower, and certainly safer for the grower, the environment, and the consumer. So, and I've worked on uh, BT, Bacillus thuringiensis, for about four decades. And uh, it's, it's something, if, if you go back and read Rachel Carson in Silent Spring, in the last chapter, you know, where she says, uh, is there, we need a way forward to get out of the insecticide paradigm. And she says, why don't we use more BT? Um, and why don't we use other things like sterile insects well, one of the reasons that people were not using a lot of BT, um, it only had as a foliar spray, and it's been used as a foliar spray for since 1930. Um, it wasn't really that effective. You essentially had to spray it on every two to three days. It broke down in the sunlight. And uh, the insect had to consume the plant material that the BT was on. And so that was not a really effective way of delivering BT. And then some people had an idea, a number of university scientists and companies had an idea that why don't we, now that we're in the age of genetic engineering, why don't we get the plant to express the BT protein? It's very safe protein uh, that organic farmers have used for decades. And uh, it's worked really well. And so, I work on, on vegetables. Well, we all know that BT has been used a lot uh, as genetically engineered plants that are expressing the BT proteins. It's used in, in corn or maize and in cotton. I kept saying, why don't we use more of it in vegetables? Mm -hmm. So this was a perfect project to jump into. So Tony, tell us why don't why haven't we used more of this in vegetables? I mean, what's what's the hang up here? Why have we not used more BT crops in vegetables? Yes. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's a long, complicated story. <laughs> but um, field crops, you know, when when B, BT corn, or BT maize, and cotton were developed, they were developed by companies that just basically wanted to apply this over a large area. And so maize and cotton are grown in large areas. Vegetables tend to be grown in smaller areas. And they also, um, there's many different vegetables, like tomatoes, broccoli, all the crucifers. Mm -hmm. So 
from a marketing standpoint and a development standpoint, the company's decided we're not going to go that way because we still need to uh, develop it for broad acreage field crops. So vegetables are, you know, what we call the minor, minor crops or orphan crops. Um, but, you know, we've seen the success of BT maize and cotton and how uh, it gives better insect control and reduces other uh, pesticide inputs. So my hope is that we'll start seeing more of these same benefits in vegetables. I think, you know, it's something that would interest consumers because, you know, we don't eat, we do eat BT corn, but we don't eat the cotton. So, I mean, vegetables are something that most people do eat and it seems like they would benefit from reduced pesticide uses. Plus, as you have seen in Bangladesh, it really has a great benefit for the farmers, especially smallholder farmers. So it seems like it has a lot of potential. Right, but people can't always eat potential that <laughs> you need uh, need to see this realized. And it's, what's really interesting about Bangladesh is that it is, it's a developing country. It's, uh, last I looked up, it was the 34th poorest country in the world out of mm -hmm. about 200. Mm -hmm. And yet they had a minister of agriculture and a prime minister who said, let's go forward with this. Mm -hmm. So as we do know, it does take political will and also education and outreach to the farmers. So this project has had that perfect storm, so to speak, of, of all of those. So let's um, at some point, hopefully our other guest, Arif Hussain, who is actually based in Bangladesh, will be able to join us. Um, but in the meantime, you know, Tony, why don't you go ahead and get us started on a PowerPoint, which can help us walk through how this process got started and some of the success you've seen there. So I've actually been working on BT eggplant or brinjal um, since uh, 2005 when uh, a previous uh, program was starting to develop it. But if you look at this picture, um, you see a farmer mm -hmm. spraying an insecticide, notice his lack of personal protective equipment. Mm -hmm. uh, the spray is going all over him. Mm -hmm. What he's trying to do is to spray to control a particular insect called the eggplant fruit and shoot borer, which is shown uh, in the picture on the right. You can see the larvae that has infested the, the fruit. So what this farmer is trying to do is to control the insect before it gets into that fruit. And you look at the statistics uh, worldwide about pesticide poisonings uh, to farmers and also the environmental uh, effect of many of these uh, insecticides that are being used. And it's uh, pretty striking. I mean, farmers, uh, you know, they're walking barefoot while they're spraying. They're spraying organophosphates and carbamates, and these are pretty pretty uh, nasty materials and many of them have already been banned in the US. But this farmer is trying to control the pest so he can sell the eggplant in the market. We see this scene throughout the world, throughout the developing world. So is there a better way of doing it? Is there a better way of controlling that pest so it doesn't infest the, the eggplant? You got to understand also that eggplant, I mean, we don't eat so much of it in the US, but in Asian foods, it is a daily thing that is consumed. And uh, eggplant functions kind of like a bread. I mean, it soaks up the, the sauces, the curries. And in Bangladesh and in India, uh, people eat eggplant on a daily basis. So it's a very important food crop throughout the Asian world. Tony, how many types of eggplant here? I see that round one, the globe, um, looks like the globe eggplant. So are there a couple different types of eggplant that you're working with or um, tell us a little bit more about that. Um, there's, in Bangladesh, there's probably a hundred different varieties of eggplant that uh, people consume. Um, as, I talk, as I will be talking about the BT eggplant, that's only in four of the hundred varieties. But um, eggplant is, I think, 
India produces about 25% of all the eggplant mm -hmm. uh, grown worldwide, but uh, India has a population of 1.2 or 3 billion. Uh, China is the main producer of eggplant, mm -hmm. and you find it in many Chinese dishes as well. Our project is working with, in Bangladesh and in the Philippines, in the Philippines, it's the same thing. Uh, many of the traditional foods um, have sauces that are very suitable for, uh, for eggplant to be included. I'm going to switch to the next slide. If you look at the eggplant production by country, and this is uh, a, a, the globe, and you can see that large, the largest dot there is actually in India, China, Bangladesh. That's where they grow a lot of eggplant. Mm -hmm. Compared to in the in the U.S., we might barbecue it, you know, during the summertime. Mm -hmm. But on a daily basis, in Asian foods, it is consumed widely. So that's where eggplant's grown. And there's this insect called the eggplant fruit and shoot borer, which is a it's a moth. Uh, it lays its eggs on on eggplant and then the larvae bur burrow into the stems or the or the fruit itself and you can see this is a distribution of eggplant fruit and shoot borer and if you remember back one slide that's where the eggplant's grown that's where the eggplant fruit and shoot borer occurs so throughout asia this is the main constraint for producing uh, eggplant. Does, does that pest only and, occur on eggplant, Tony, or does it also affect other plants? Well, eggplant is in the Solanaceous family, mm -hmm. and uh, it will attack some other Solanaceous plants like tomatoes, but its preference is really for eggplant. Mm -hmm. um, and you can see that it also occurs uh, in the Middle East, a little bit in Australia, but primarily it's in India, Bangladesh, Vietnam, Cambodia, um, so throughout there. And if we look at the what the insect is, it's just this nice looking moth that uh, lays its eggs, like I said, on the, on the stalks or on the fruit, and then the caterpillars hatch and bore into it and damage it as shown in the bottom two pictures. Well, what really the does, farmers... Does destroy the whole, the whole fruit then for the farmer, it looks like. They can't get any use out of a, out of a crop once it's been no. infested with that. No, they, they can feed it to animals, mm -hmm. uh, but it's not suitable for human consumption. Um, and if it burrows if it burrows into the stock before the fruit is uh, produced, um, it'll just kill the stock so there won't be any flower and there won't be any uh, fruit uh, mm. produced at the end of that stock. So it's a nice looking insect, but it causes lots of problems to farmers. So the idea is that the farmers will put on an insecticide uh, to the fruit and to the stock so that when the eggs are when the eggs hatch into larvae the larvae will be exposed to the insecticide and then and then die mm -hmm. so i mentioned a little bit earlier this wonderful thing called bt or bacillus thuringiensis it's a common soil bacterium it also occurs on plants naturally there's many, many different strains of Bt, and each strain will produce a different protein. Some of these proteins are toxic to insects, to certain strains of insects, primarily caterpillars and, uh, and beetles, and then also some flies. It's very safe to humans uh, and to the environment. Like I said, it's been used by organic growers for a number of years but still it accounts for less than 1% of all insecticides used mm -hmm. when used as a foliar spray. So again, it's the proteins from the bacterium 
that when ingested by caterpillars, uh, that protein will bind to a site in the gut of the caterpillar and then uh, latch onto that. The caterpillar will stop feeding and then and die within two or three days. Um, Does that have ahead, any effect on humans when they eat it? No, it has no effect. On, and in fact, really, we, we consume it uh, on a daily basis, you know, just low doses of it in the environment. Mm -hmm. But no, it, it, uh, it has no harm to humans. And the reason it doesn't is because we don't have these receptors in our gut that, it, that the protein binds to. You know, we eat a lot of different kinds of proteins besides, you know, the, the usual food proteins. And most of these just, and they just pass through our gut because we don't have the receptors uh, mm -hmm. to bind those proteins. So this is uh, just, it affects some species of insects, um, but no mammals. And it's very, very safe. Like I said, Rachel Carson in Silent Spring said, why don't we use more of this? And uh, well, one of the reasons we don't use more of it is because it is not quite as effective as a lot of other insecticides when it is sprayed on. However, when, it's, when the plant produces the protein, then it gets, the plant gets pretty much complete coverage and so if an insect attacks at one part of the plant and Bt protein is in that plant, then it is, uh, then the insect will just stop feeding right away. And you've done other studies too, Tony, that have shown that this doesn't affect beneficial insects too. It's really pretty species specific in terms of going after the pest insects rather than, you know, beneficial things in the field. I recently saw something about even soil microbes are not adversely affected by BT. Is that right? Your? We probably spent 10 years working on the, what we call the non-target mm -hmm. potential effects of BT compared to other insecticides. And uh, the BT is not, it does not affect uh, parasites or predators. Uh, of of the insects, so it really uh, allows the biocontrol agents to flourish in this environment because there are not other insecticides that are more broad spectrum that are being used. Mm -hmm. Basically, the BT uh, takes care of the key pest, in this case caterpillars, and doesn't affect non-target organisms like. Mm -hmm parasites and predators or honeybees or many of the other beneficial insects that we have out there. So it really supports a more diverse field for the, an insect diverse field for the farmer that is um, more ecologically sound? Right, it, uh, it really promotes biodiversity mm -hmm. as such while taking care of the main pest, which is a caterpillar in this case. Sounds great. So back in 1987, some people had an idea about making uh, the insect resistant plant, in this case, tomato plant, by engineering the plant to express BT protein. Uh, Joan, your question a little bit earlier, why don't we see more vegetables uh, that are BT? Well, this was an experiment it, uh, showing that you could actually create tomatoes that were resistant to insects but this tomato has never hit the market. In fact, when we look at uh, what is out there uh, as a BT crop, it's just uh, maize or corn and cotton, um, some soybeans, but now we have this project in Bangladesh and in the Philippines that is using it to try and control uh, insects that are affecting this important vegetable crop in Asia. If we look at just corn and cotton, we look at, uh, this is the growth since 1996 when these plants were first produced. 
And if you look at the blue line there, that's just Bt plants alone. Um, it went up to, so in 2018, there was probably about 21 million hectares of Bt corn or, or cotton. But if you look at the, the orange line or the gold line, it's about 80 million acres, and that is of BT, BT crops combined with herbicide tolerant crops. And so it's, if you look at that, that's 80 million hectares, combine it with the, with the 21 million hectares, there's over 100 million hectares of BT crops that are out there right now. So I like to say, actually, what was once a very minor insecticide, Bt, when it's used as a foliar spray, has now become a major, major insecticide when incorporated into Bt crops. So as an ecologist also, uh, you know, I look, okay, what's the effect of this? You know, we got 100 and over 100 million hectares of Bt crops out there. What has this done? Well, there's lots of different reports out there that shows there's been an insecticide reduction from 96 to 2014, for example, and there is an updated version that will come out. In maize or corn, we've seen about a 52% reduction in insecticide use. Wow, that's huge. And in cotton, about a 28%. So we're now able to control the key pests, the arthropod pests of those crops by using BT. So I think that's been a tremendous success. And so Tony, is it yeah. be, do you still have to apply some pesticides because the BT doesn't get everything that attacks them like the maize and the cotton? That's right. For example, um, corn and, and cotton are uh, they're, uh, attacked also by mites by some other arthropods. But what you can do there is to use some very selective insecticides that will take care of those, what we call sucking insects, rather than chewing insects. So you can take care of those by adding an insecticide that's more selective. And but what you've done is you've taken care of the key pest. Mm -hmm. And in the past, uh, you know, use, trying to control the key pest often has been done with broad spectrum insecticides. Those broad spectrum insecticides not only can affect the key pest and maybe some of these uh, sucking insects, but they also affect the non-target organisms like the parasites and the predators. Mm -hmm. So by controlling the key pest with, uh, with BT crops, you can also have you know, a, another strategy for controlling the, 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 other, uh, the other pests. And that's in fact what this term integrated pest management is all about. You try and control the key pest through what we call host plant resistance and then take care of the other pests that we're building up without using broad spectrum insecticides that can upset the ecology of the system. Mm -hmm. So they're biological systems, so they always change and you have to uh, adapt mm -hmm. to, uh, to doing that. So back in, in uh, 2005, there was a project that was developed with Cornell University, uh, USAID, and a seed company called Maiko, which is an Indian-based seed company, to try and control the uh, eggplant, fruit, and shoot borer. If you look at the top left, that's the damage that the fruit and shoot borer does. Look to the right, and that's how farmers, again, no protective uh, equipment at all, but they spray, and they spray a lot. Mm -hmm. I've been in fields where the farmers have said, uh, you know, we spray twice a day towards harvest. Oh, gosh. 
this can add up to you know well over a hundred sprays during the season. Wow. So are they not using protective gear just because they haven't been trained or they can't afford it or or why do they use it that way? That's a complicated question. Certainly um, they many of the farmers realize that by spraying they oftentimes have skin irritation. They will sometimes vomit after after spraying. They know the hazards of it. Mm -hmm. But the protective equipment is not so available to them. It's awfully hot mm -hmm. as well. Mm -hmm. So to, you know, have proper uh, equipment that is, that's going to be uh, very uncomfortable for them. But at least, you know, they could put on shoes. They could put on, uh, they could put on some other uh, protective equipment. But the fact is that they really don't do that. Mm -hmm. And so it's not uncommon to have, a lot of uh, skin ir irritation and pesticide poisoning. Mm -hmm. Not to mention what's happening in the environment. Yeah, that's really tragic. So they just sort of accept that as part of the the cost of being a farmer to, to have those sorts of ailments. Yeah. And There's been a number of studies by the World Health Organization and other groups uh, about this. And, you know, the pesticide uh, inputs uh, have been going steadily in these developing countries because the farmers have more pests to deal with and they're just trying to make a living. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, selling eggplant, uh, very, very popular vegetable, especially around Ramadan, they can get a really good price for it. Mm -hmm. But they can only sell, you know, the good quality, the non-infested uh, eggplant. So Tony, tell us just for a minute too, a little bit about sort of these farmers. I mean, they're, we, oftentimes people in the West think of these very large operations and maybe it doesn't matter if one field is infested with insects because you've got another one that's coming off. So, I mean, why do these, why is, you know, getting a crop off so important to these farmers in terms of their livelihood and the size of their farms and their ability to recover from loss? So these are resource, poor farmers primarily, they really don't have a lot of money. Mm -hmm. um, and so if they are not able to sell their crop, that, that severely restricts their, their income. Consequently, you know, the ability for the children to, to go to school and to build a better lives for themselves. Um, so it, it's, <laughs> It has consequences throughout society and many of the farmers and in, in Bangladesh, there's probably 150,000 farmers who are producing eggplant. Um, that's a substantial number of farmers in, and in developing countries, the farmers are the consumers as well. Mm -hmm. So the farmers know what it takes to try and produce a good crop mm -hmm. and uh, they know that they there's hazard in producing it, but it is part of the their the technology that they have right now. Mm -hmm. We'd like to try and give them some newer technology, safer technology. So do these farmers typically only grow eggplant or do they have farms that are mixed crops? Well, they'll grow eggplant, they'll grow rice. They grow potatoes, etc. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. But the rice and potatoes are also subject to lots of pest problems as well. Mm -hmm. uh, late blight, which is a, a fungal disease of potatoes, can really wipe out a crop. Mm -hmm. There are efforts underway with USAID, in fact, to develop uh, late blight resistant potatoes. So, but eggplant is is kind of the lead mm -hmm. uh, product on biotechnology in Bangladesh and in other countries. Mm -hmm. And the picture down at the bottom left is uh, this woman is giving a package of seed. This woman is uh, Usha Barwali, who is uh, uh, I think she's vice president of Myco Seeds. Mm -hmm. Her father actually developed Myco Seeds and won the, won the World Food Prize for doing so. 
So she's, to, she's made BT eggplant and is giving the seeds to this chancellor at Tamil Nadu University in India so he can give it to his breeders so they can lo produce, they, they will put it into their local varieties. Mm -hmm. And the picture on the right shows the yield from a plot in India of, uh, obviously on the right, it's a BT uh, eggplant, clean, high yielding. The plot, the group of eggplant on the left is um, traditional non-BT eggplant. So the yields are much, much higher. And if you look closely at the, at both eggplant groups, there's no holes in the group on the right, a lot of holes on the group on the left, even though it was sprayed regularly. So Gosh. the difference is really black and white. It is. And, and so in India, we had trials there for 10 years. Mm -hmm. And uh, this, is, this is one of the many examples of how well the BT uh, worked. It also in India went through safety programs make sure that it was uh, safe for consumers, safe for the environment. And after many large scale trials, um, the Indian government uh, approved it, but it went all the way through the process and the final gatekeeper was the Minister for the Environment and Forests. And this person, well, in India, Politics are central. So there was opposition led by Greenpeace and some other groups. So the Minister of Agriculture, Minister of Forest and Environment actually put a moratorium on it. And Greenpeace really has an anti-biotechnology policy, uh, not really based on science, but based on, on some politics, which we could discuss for a couple of hours. <laughs> but Greenpeace put, uh, it's reported $100 million into an effort to try and derail it. Oh, gosh. And in February 9th, 2010, the Minister of Environment and Forest put a moratorium, which continues to this day, 10 year, you know, more than 10 years later. And uh, I, so farmers, if they want to produce eggplant in India, they still have to spray it on a regular basis. It is kind of shocking to think about how many pesticides have been sprayed, how much pesticide has been sprayed over those last 10 years because of this prohibition that didn't need to be sprayed. It's quite shocking. <laughs> well, when I was talking to a grower uh, in India, you know, he said, uh, I said, what do, you, what do you spray with? And he told me, and I said, hmm, how often do you spray? And he said, well, right before harvest, maybe twice a day. And I said, that's, that's a lot of insecticide load. I said, do you eat this crop? And he said, uh, no, I, I don't. I, uh, I buy my neighbor's crop. I said, you know what he sprays? And he said, well, I don't really know. But, you know, to produce it under this, tremendous pressure from the eggplant fruit and shoot borer, you know, you, you've got to have some way of control. And, and really, it's, it's a choice. How do you control insect pests? How do you do that? You have choices. We would like to make BT eggplant one of the choices that farmers have. Mm -hmm. This is a Bangladesh field trial. Um, and you can see two eggplants there. The one on the left is a BT eggplant. The one on the right is a non-BT eggplant that has been sprayed regularly. Same wow. variety. The only difference is that the BT eggplant is expressing a, a, a protein that is toxic to the eggplant fruit and shoot borer. I mean, it's, it's just black and white. Yeah, it is. I yeah. mean, I think, I think I assumed that if they were spraying, they would end up with this perfect fruit. But even with that kind of spraying, they still have so much damage that it's must, that must affect their yields and their prices at the market too. 
there was a, <laughs> I was in a field in, uh, with an eggplant in Bangladesh and talking with one of the farmers. And I, first of all, I went over to his non-BT eggplant uh, field. And I said, how many times did you spray here? And he said, oh, I sprayed about a hundred. Well, every one of the plants that I looked at uh, was infested. Mm. And then we went into the BT field and I said, how many times do you spray here? And he said, I sprayed twice, once for aphids and once for white flies. Every plant was perfectly clean. Wow. It's just black and white. Yeah, that real scene is believing. So why did, <laughs> what happened in India versus what happened in Bangladesh? Well, this is uh, the Minister of Agriculture who is distributing seeds of the BT brinjal or eggplant. It's called brinjal in, in India and Bangladesh. She was distributing these uh, seedlings to 20 farmers in 2014. Mm -hmm. Soon after, well, to get, to be able to grow uh, BT or any genetically engineered crop, you need to go through a long regulatory process. And Bangladesh did this. And in 2014, 20 f farmers were able to grow BT uh, brinjal mm -hmm. due to the Minister of Agriculture. Interesting enough, when the Minister of the Environment and Forest in India put this moratorium on it, she came over to Cornell in 20. 11 and I met with her and she said we'd like to go ahead and go with this project and I said well you know what happened in India and she said yes India is our neighbor but we are an independent country and my job as a minister of agriculture is to feed 160 million people and to protect the environment and we'd like Cornell's help to go forward with this. Um, and I said, well, what about groups that will, will oppose this in Bangladesh? And she said, Bangladesh is such a poor country that we really don't have, they can't fundraise in our country. So we really don't have a lot of anti-biotechnology groups. So how can you refuse uh, when, when the Minister of Agriculture says, you know, can we get your help? in working in Bangladesh. Mm -hmm. So um, encouraging to see an elected official who is concerned about the welfare of the, of the people that way. Yeah, that was her job. She said, mm -hmm. feed 160 million people and protect the environment. So it's interesting, politics plays an important role in this. In Bangladesh, it was a politician who said, let's go forward. Mm -hmm. In India, it was a politician who said, uh, let's stop. Mm -hmm. And, you know, they're adjacent countries, so they share a border and there's many Indian farmers who are now looking in Bangladesh and saying, why can they use this technology that is so favorable and we cannot? Mm -hmm. Tony, at this point, I'm just going to take a second and bring in Arif and introduce him because maybe we'll want him to weigh in on some of these political issues. So um, welcome, Arif, and I know you've had a big day with a, a long seminar and product workshop today. So thank you for joining us. And uh, Arif is a 2015 Alliance for Science Global Leadership Fellow, and he is currently the Executive Director of Farming Future Bangladesh, which is really working to help the people in Bangladesh understand this technology and its applications. So hi, Arif, how are you doing today? Uh, I'm fine. I'm glad to be here. Good, thank you. With you and Tony. Good. Yep. So is Mattia Chowdhury still the Minister for Agriculture there, Arif, or do you have someone new in that position? Uh, uh, we, we have a new Minister of Agriculture, um, Dr. Muhammad Abdul Razak, who is, uh, happened to be an agriculturist, mm -hmm. and he did his PhD in University of Pardo. Mm -hmm. Uh, and we have uh, the first uh, agriculturist as the agriculture minister in history of Bangladesh. And do you still have, is he receptive to GM technology or what kind of a, a, 
an attitude does he have toward this? So, you know, like uh, uh, we have some other priorities in regard to food safety and security. Mm -hmm. And uh, in, in recent times, uh, 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 the pandemic has uh, changed a lot in this discussion and portfolio. Mm -hmm. And the Minister of Agriculture, he is actually been busy in handling a couple of other priorities, uh, for example, you know, like uh, farm mechanization, uh, then market ensuring a fair price of the, of the produce for the farmer. Mm -hmm. And uh, this biotech crop, it, in, in, in our country, we have a Minister of Environment who are actually responsible to give approval of the crop. Mm -hmm. And Minister of Agriculture, uh, under his authority, we have a couple of research institutes, as Tony mentioned, uh, BD, then Bari, who were, uh, who were ideally like the ideal uh, uh, entities to develop biotech crop and GM crop. Mm -hmm. So it takes a lot of time to uh, follow all the procedure that we have, all the legal issues that we have, uh, both nationally and internationally, we had to go through and follow all the like regulations, Cartagena protocol and the local protocol. And fortunately, we have a pro-tech government. Um, our government is pro-tech, and that means that it, it comes with all kinds of technology, whether it's uh, GMO, gene editing, or any modern technology for, you know, like precision farming or uh, low carbon emission. These kind of things are actually what we are trying to cope with uh, mm -hmm. because as Tony mentioned the quote of uh, Minister of Agriculture of uh, Motia Chaudhary, the former minister, uh, in, one, her, in, in one, one occasion she mentioned that uh, we have 160 million people and we can let people sleep in empty stomach. Right. Mm -hmm. So uh, you know like the philosophy and the discussion that we have over the period of time um, in regard or in comparison to science versus politics. So for a politician, it's very complicated to uh, be very like, uh, uh, how, how should I frame it? I mean, it's very complicated to define someone pro and anti mm -hmm. because there are multiple other factors in regard to biotech crop. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, for example, we have developed BT eggplant uh, in 2013, it was approved. Mm -hmm. And in 2014, January, uh, 20 farmers were given a crop for the very first time, the seedling. And until today, we have 30,000 farmers. But still, we are struggling with some of the very critically important issues, for example, stewardship, uh, private sector involvement. I would definitely uh, stress the issue of private sector involvement because government can actually cover only 15 to 20% of the total seed demand for overall, you know, like vegetable crop sector in Bangladesh. Mm -hmm. And rest of the uh, mm -hmm. demand is actually covered by private sector. And if I go with the issue of stewardship and maintaining the quality of the science and sustaining it for a long period of time, as you have seen in India, uh, the BT cotton, the first generation of BT cotton uh, had to uh, um, uh, upgrade the science in a way that uh, they had to introduce double gene crop to make it more resistant to, to the um, um, infestation. Mm -hmm. So it, it requires a lot of uh, care from different authority, different partners and different uh, collaborators. Um, okay. In a short, simple uh, answer, our Minister of Agriculture is pro-biotech and pro-GMO, mm -hmm. but he's not the only person to get, give approval to any GM crop. We follow a strong regulation. We had to maintain the quality of the research. We have to follow international compliance and regulations. And if everything is ensured, only then we are allowed to move ahead with the, with the science. Okay. Thanks for adding that, Arif. Okay, so Tony, um, I guess we can get back to, you've got a, you're showing us how this has been adopted. So continue on, please. So as Arif mentioned, there were 20 farmers in 20, 2013, 2014. We now have almost 27,000 farmers. And it's probably actually around maybe 35,000 farmers because farmers can save the seed. The seed is given to them uh, free 
or they can buy it for a very, very low price from one of the markets. Um, so probably 30, 35,000 farmers are, are using this. Mm -hmm. And uh, they're pretty happy with it. We, let's see. If we look at the results at impacts, um, growing the BT eggplant, the fruit infestation is less than 1%. And remember, if, uh, even when farmers spray it regularly, it can be up to 70%. Mm -hmm. So less than 1% infestation. And in the trial that we conducted, a research trial, um, the same line of, of eggplant, even when it was sprayed, uh, was like 45%. Farmers are saving at least 61% on pesticide costs. Farmers are, have a six-fold increase in their net returns, 21% increase in gross returns, and nearly a 20% higher fruit yield. So this has been a tremendous success from an agronomic standpoint. Mm -hmm. We've also, the project has worked to uh, develop stewardship, which we've talked about a little bit earlier, to make sure that this crop is durable in, in the field. And also we work with uh, a reef to develop some effective communication systems regarding this. So it's really been a, it's been a, a good success and a model, I think, for what can happen with this technology. But we also have to think about the way forward. Um, the background for, of these varieties that the BT was put into, uh, they're, they're, as many of the crops, as many of the eggplant is, they're susceptible to, to wilt resistance. So farmers, we need to make some varieties that have some wilt resistance as well. And that wilt resistance can be bred uh, through conventional methods, not necessarily genetic engineering, although that should be an option. A project has also helped um, the scientific community in Bangladesh uh, develop or have better practices for producing the seed and checking the seed quality. And we certainly work with the farmers to try and uh, get them to adopt better field practices as well. Reef mentioned um, we need to develop second generation product. As he mentioned in India, um, cotton was a single gene plant. I I've worked on <laughs> BT plants for longer than I'd like to think decades. And we know that having two genes in a plant will make the plant much more durable so the insects will not evolve resistance to it. Mm -hmm. So that's something that we have to really work with a company to, or with the government to try and put in a second gene. Um, and I'm just to create an... Uh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. I, I just, there was somebody had <clears throat> made a comment on in the Facebook Live section that I, I wanted you to address, and, and maybe both of you, and that is the seeds of BT brinjal, they say, are imposed on farmers, and those who have taken it are very unhappy. Um, so, I mean, when we saw this last slide that you had where we saw the returns at the higher yields, the higher profits, the lower costs, I mean, what is the reality here? Are farmers who have taken this happy or unhappy? Have they been successful or unsuccessful? Well, farmers throughout the world, if they see a technology that they will, that will give them an advantage, they will adopt it. No one is holding a gun to their heads and say, you know, plant this variety, plant this. Um, so I, I've heard this argument before in Bangladesh that the farmers are trying it and then not trying it the next year. That has not been our experience at all. Um, how do you go from 20 farmers up to 27,000 farmers mm -hmm. if farmers don't like it? And we had a, uh, a field day 
uh, in Bangladesh. This was a couple of years ago. And uh, there was a farmer who was growing, with, growing it. He was so ecstatic with the results. So he gathered a number of other farmers and talked to them about it. These are eggplant farmers. And he said, uh, at the end of the, the field day, he said, this is my experience with it. I made a good amount of money. I've only sprayed it very infrequently. And uh, farmers can talk with other farmers. And at the end, it said, he asked how many farmers would like to grow it next year? Everyone raised their hand. Mm -hmm. And we just did, we did another survey in which 40% of the farmers who were not growing uh, in, in the survey, who were not growing BT eggplant, when they learned about it, like 90% said, we want to grow it next year. Mm -hmm. So again, I think when someone says that or the, or the fruit itself, and you can see this is a district, they learned about it, like 90% said, we want to grow it next year. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So again, I think when someone says that, so this is an, ec an echo that's occurring, <laughs> I'm hearing. Yes, but um, again, again, farmers are smart people. If they can see a technology that will give them an advantage, no farmer likes to spray insecticide. They know it's hazardous to their health. If they can avoid spraying so much, they will do that mm -hmm. by adopting BT eggplant. Arif, is there anything uh, you'd like to add? Uh, yeah, yes. uh, I, I'd like to compliment with Tony, you know. Um, so this farmer, you have to uh, realize the historical uh, and cultural background of all these farmers that we have in Bangladesh. Uh, most actually have uh, less than uh, 0.1 acres of land, very tiny little plot to uh, grow vegetable. And uh, in, 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 in many, I mean, for, for many of the farmers, they actually don't own any land. Uh, they rent it from a landlord to grow the crop. So for them, the equation is very clear and simple. Uh, they're investing money. Mm, their life and livelihood is depending on the crop they produce. They need to cut benefit from their crop. And you don't need to be a scientist or an engineer of, you know, um, bioengineer. You, you don't need to be a super smart to learn this simple math and equation. Mm -hmm. The crop needs to be profitable. And as Tony mentioned, that it's been almost like six years, from 20 to 27,000 plus, I mean 30, or probably like 35,000 plus. Because farmers in Bangladesh can actually save the seed, they can multiply it. And as you know, in most of the Asian countries, farmers do love to share their crop and seed with, with a neighboring farmer. So the actual number could be more mm -hmm. uh, in case of BT eggplant because it's working on the ground. And this is the first uh, uh, evidence of a biotech crop developed by public sector scientists for the resource poor farmer. Uh, and it's working. Mm -hmm. I consumed, uh, I tried BT eggplant first in 2013 in Bari. And since then I've been eating it every season. I mean, yeah, and uh, we don't have any problem. I mean, in fact, um, it's tastier than regular eggplant. Because for regular eggplant, you need to spray pesticide twice a week, twice a week. If you spray less than that, the next week you'll find that your whole land is destroyed and infested with fruit and shoot borer. So for regular, regular eggplant, you spray pesticide at least 80 to 100 times in a season. You harvest your crop and you have to throw away 30 to 40% of your produce because even after spraying pesticide, you get infestation. Mm -hmm. And those infested crop, uh, people don't buy those and even they, they, they sometimes throw it away, not even, um, uh, they, they can't use it even for uh, feeding the cattle. Mm -hmm. 
Mm -hmm. So in one side, you have a simple solution and option of having a healthier crop that requires no pesticide for fruit and shoot burn insect, can save more than 80 to 90% of the production cost, and you can get 100% of your produce from BT plant. You don't need to throw away any single crop, any single fruit. Okay. okay. So even, even for the farmer, uh, uh, as Tony mentioned that uh, Bangladesh Agriculture Research Institute, uh, they developed this uh, BT uh, eggplant and they applied it to a minister of environment and they got it approved and they, uh, they are distributing it through Department of Extension. It's not a business entity. I mean, farmers are getting it for free. Mm -hmm. And now, no, I know many farmers. Honestly, I'm on the ground now. I know many, many BT eggplant farmer and I have one-on-one -one conversation with them. None were asked to uh, grow it. None were imposed to grow it. So these kind of misinformation and disinformation are actually hampering our friend who are trying to get it approved in Philippines. Our colleagues who have been doing research on BT eggplant uh, before we did in Bangladesh, in India, and our African friends who are trying other biotech crop, for example, cassava, cotton, and other, other, other crop. So this misinformation and confusion are actually hampering the science. And uh, I, I, I don't know. I mean, we should request people not to misguide other people with misinformation. <laughs> it's a common problem. Hey, thanks for clarifying that, Arif. So we're, we're getting close to the end of the time. So Tony, I'll just, I'll stop interrupting you and let you finish your PowerPoint here. That's the last slide. Oh, gosh. So I think it was a good time. <laughs> Very glad that Arif uh, also uh, was able to to join us and give his perspective. But really, yes, I mean, I hear this information just like Arif does that, you know, farmers are avoiding uh, GM crops. Um, and I don't know, I would hate to use the word, but I'm going to use it, fake news. Mm -hmm. um, the, no one is telling these growers that they have to grow it. Mm -hmm. Growers are smart people mm -hmm. and they will make a choice if they have that choice. Mm -hmm. And in Bangladesh, they now have that choice. Mm -hmm. And we'd like to see farmers also have choices to use modern technology to improve their livelihoods in many other countries. But the misinformation that's going around is uh, slowing that process. But in Bangladesh, we had a minister of agriculture and a prime minister who basically believe in science. The minister of agriculture was a scientist herself. Mm -hmm. And she said, let's go forward. And I'm glad we did. Yeah. Because it's, it has really improved, improved the lives of resource poor farmers in Bangladesh. We hope that it gets approved soon in the Philippines. And we hope that farmers in India will also have it available to them in the future. And I had one other question that I'll just throw in here. It's not exactly related to Brinjal, but um, a person had asked, do you foresee any GM crops that address sucking insects? Yes, there is, surprisingly, we've, uh, there's actually a BT um, that has a protein that is effective against some sucking insects. Mm -hmm. And that is being incorporated into, into cotton, one of the world's largest crops. Mm -hmm. But there are other uh, ways that you can engineer crops too, besides with BT. Mm -hmm. um, there are other proteins uh, or hormones that can be can be added. Mm -hmm. The thing about BT, the, why it has been such a dominant player in the, uh, we'd say genetically engineered insect resistant crops, the reason BT has become such a dominant player is we have such a long history about the safety of BT. Mm -hmm. And so it gets through the regulatory system much, much quicker. Mm -hmm. That's really helpful. 
All right, so I'll just um, say that our next program next week will be about the GMO papaya and its success in Hawaii and its possible applications in Latin America. And so I just want to say thank you so much, Tony and Ari, for, for sharing this information about what is truly a success story in Bangladesh. As you said, it's improving farmers' lives, it's helping the environment, it's benefiting consumers because they're able to get a better quality product with a lot less pesticide on it. So again, it's hopefully allowing this kind of choice to go forward with farmers in other countries too. Next up is the Philippines, right? That's where you're moving through an approval, pro the regulatory process there, is that correct? That's correct. The, uh, uh, the first dossier, regulatory dossier was submitted uh, last week. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, it, it, it's not easy to get uh, many of these genetically engineered crops uh, in the hands of farmers because the regulatory process is much, much more complicated. Mm -hmm. uh, but with the safety that we've seen with BT Brinjal, hopefully other countries throughout the world uh, will be able to adopt that sooner because of the work that's been done in Bangladesh. Mm -hmm. It's a good success story. All right, well, thank you, Tony, and thank you, Arif, and um, I appreciate you both making the time to join us today. Okay, thanks, Joan. Okay, all right. Thank you, Joan, Bye -bye. and thank, thank everyone for uh, listening to us. Thank you. Okay.